And good evening and welcome to Kaufman Corner, a Kansas City Royals podcast. The first we debut right here uh, with us, uh, I would say, as always, uh, like we'd always done it. Maybe I will in future episodes. But uh, the good doctor, Dr. Randy Gisele, of course, uh, one of the founders of Baseball Prospectus, uh, author of Rob and Randy on the Royals. Randy on the Royals, uh, written for The Ringer, Grantland, The Athletic. What else am I missing? Are you any other impressive credentials, Doc? I dabbled with ESPN, Sports Illustrated, I think once or twice. Um, the New York Times published me once. I don't know what got into them. Uh, you know. <laughs> I love I've, it. Gotten, I've gotten around. I love it. And of course, uh, and not of course, if, you, if you're new uh, to the podcast uh, and, and new, if this is the first one you've heard, uh, my name is Seren Petro. I'm from Sports Radio 810 in WHB. I've been covering the Kansas City Royals for the better part of 30 years. Don't let the gray hair fool you. I'm really not that old. I started when I was six, so keep that in mind. But, uh, yes, covering the Royals for about 30 years and uh, very excited uh, to be working on this podcast. Uh, I've got a couple other podcasts that maybe some folks know that are on the football side or on the baseball side. Uh, Randy and I have talked for years uh, on the radio and uh, thrilled to be now doing the podcast and the streaming podcast. you got to bear with us. Where we're getting everything together here at the last minute. Uh, if you're catching us via the podcast, we stream live. Usually it looks like it's going to be Sunday nights at 10 o'clock. If you're with us live on the stream, uh, we appreciate you joining us here as well. But we will have the podcast, but it takes a little time for all those things to cycle through. So if you don't have it tomorrow, we'll keep telling you where to find it. We'll keep tweeting. Make sure you're following uh, Randy at Gisarely. It's right there on the bottom of the scroll of the screen. Uh, at Gisarely is where you can find him. At Seren Petro, we'll be tweeting it out. And you can find the links there. And, and Randy, really just, you know, your thoughts overall on on what it is we're wanting to do here and try to accomplish with our with our our humble little podcast about the Kansas City Royals. Well, like you said, we've we've been talking for years. I've come on your your show on eight ten for for many years, but um, I sort of t- took a step back a few years ago, focusing on my family, my uh, my medical practice. Obviously, this is not what I do all the time. Um, but you uh, you've been trying to lure me back into the game here for uh, for a year or two, and uh, I just felt like the time was right with the Royals. Uh, my, my life is in a, a good place uh, with with the family, and I've got a little bit more free time. But I don't think I'd be doing this if I didn't feel like the Royals were at least headed in the right direction. Uh, it's been, uh, it, you know, they, they had quite a fallow period there after, after <laughs> when, when, when you, when you a couple of pennants and, you know, the, the, the 2016, 2017, they were still competitive. Then the bottom fell out. Um, they really started to pay the price for uh, not developing talent uh, in the early part of the 2010s. But the last two years, you know, they, they really made a change in the organization about two years ago. We saw that with their minor league development. Um, their, their farm system has developed uh, significantly over the last couple of years. And they're doing some of the little things that I really like to see, um, you know, organizations, they've really kind of uh, finally moved into the modern era when it comes to um, using technology to develop players, um, the stuff that they've done with um, uh, some of the prospects like Nick, Nick Prado and MJ Melendez and, and completely re- refurbishing their swings at the minor league level. Like, I, I joke that that half the time the Royals remind me of the Tampa Bay Rays and half the time they remind me of the 1990s Royals. Um, so they're still kind of in that transition period. But I, I feel for the first time in a few years, I feel like, uh, you know, the, the light is at the end of the tunnel. And I kind of kind of wanted to be there when they finally started being competitive again and hoping that they uh, can catch a little lightning in the bottle that they had in 2014, 2015, because, you know, we, we suffered for a generation, my friend, but right. the 14 months, 15 months from like late 2014 until they won the World Series is the greatest 14 or 15 months I've ever experienced as a sports fan. I I mean, and I say that as a, as a very proud Kansas City Chiefs fan as well. Um, and, and frankly, I doubt I will ever have an experience like that ever again. I mean, it would take it would take a team. Take, take, take the world of Chiefs to, to miss the playoffs for 29 right. years in a row to set that up. Um, so that was part of it. But um, I want to taste of that again. It's been a while yeah. now. And uh, and I think the Royals are, you know, it's good. They're taking two steps, two steps forward and one step back. But I think they're heading in the right direction. And I think it'll be fun to talk about it and praise them when they do things right and mock them and criticize them when they do things wrong. And, uh, you know, enjoy the experience. 
I, you know, and and I, and I agree. And thank you, Steve. Uh, again, if uh, you're catching us via the podcast on down the road, uh, you can comment. If you're uh, watching us on Twitch, on Facebook, on YouTube, uh, Twitter, you can't comment, but uh, you can catch us on Twitter as well. But if you're on uh, Facebook and YouTube and Twitch, you can uh, send your comments up and we can see them. We'll put some of them up there. We're going to be doing a couple of uh, uh, fun things with it. We, we love the interaction. So, uh, like I said, if you're catching us later on the podcast uh, and you want to catch us during the stream and be a part of the uh, broadcast, uh, we'll be popping up comments uh, of, of the listeners and, and everybody who's uh, a part of it. And we'd like everybody to be as much a part of the show as possible. And, and I can tell you, for me, you know, listen, like I said, covering the Royals for 30 years, there, there's nobody I enjoy talking Royals baseball more with. Most of the time, than than Randy, uh, but I, the times I don't enjoy it are the times that I've been challenged and disproven, like or proven wrong, and which is something that, uh, like at that moment, I don't like. But later on, I go back and I'm like, all right, that was good stuff, and I learned something. And there's nobody I learned more about Royals baseball from than Randy Gisarelli. And so I, I'm looking forward to it. I love the idea. Uh, you know, we'll, we've, we'll, we've talked about it all through the regular season. We're going to be here uh, for sure. And then we'll probably slide it back a little bit. Uh, we, we don't know whether that's going to be every couple of weeks, every four weeks, something like that. Certainly any kind of big news happens with the Royals. We'll jump on as quick as we can uh, about it. But just uh, excited. I'm with you, Randy, whether it's – look, I, I'm going to be covering the team no matter what. I do think that there's a lot to like about the team. And I also and think, and let me just ask you this, and I know, of course, that people don't know, Randy is a displaced Royals fan who lives in Chicago, but still uh, obsesses about the Royals, writes about the Royals, thinks about the Royals, uh, tweets a lot about the Royals. Those of you that follow him on Twitter uh, certainly know that. I, I am amazed, I said this, and I just want to get your thoughts on this. I'm amazed that I, I consider it almost kid gloves that the Royals get treated with uh, in Kansas City. Like, you know, I I heard a couple of people be like, "Well, I'm not even, I'm not even worried about what the record is this year. I just want to see this." And I was like, "If anybody ever said that about the Kansas City Chiefs, they they would be you know thrown out of their job in the media." Uh, why do you think it is that Royals fans are so much more uh, patient and or tolerant uh, of a lack of success? I mean, the, the cynical answer would be the what the, what the term uh, the soft bigotry of low expectations. Like you just you you're you know if you if you're a Royals fan over the age of about 25, then you know you know what it's like to to root for a team where losing 90 games is a successful season, and maybe they've just been conditioned to not expect much from their team. Um, and I, I think that baseball's financial structure, the which which the powers that be in baseball love to promote the idea that it's really difficult for a small market team to win. I think that is vastly overstated, but I think that the perception among baseball fans is that the Royals on some level were are handed a, uh, a you know, a weak deck that they are, the, the cards are stacked against them. I would like to politely disagree. I mean, like I right. mentioned the Tampa Bay Rays, obviously we've, we've seen what the Oakland A's have done over the years. And I'd also like to point out that the, while, while the Royals do play in a small market, maybe they can't afford the payroll of the New York Yankees or the Los Angeles Dodgers or whatever. They're not in the same division as the New York Yankees, the Los Angeles Dodgers. And the single greatest thing that baseball has done for the Royals is put them in the American League Central. And they're going up against the Indians, the White Sox, the Tigers, the Twins. There is no reason from a financial standpoint that they cannot hang with those teams. In fact, at this point, I would say they're in a much better financial situation than, than the Cleveland Indians are. Right. Um, and so it does frustrate me, frustrate me to some extent that f some fans and some people in the media give them, uh, you know, give give them a pass when they don't play well. And the Royals, from since 1998, when when the the um, the Diamondbacks and Rays started, so the, in the 30 team era of baseball, the Royals have fewer wins than every other franchise in the sport. Yeah, you know, now they managed to cluster those wins extremely efficiently in 2014 and 2015. And by some, you know, minor miracle, they have won more pennants than, you know, the Pirates, the Brewers, uh, the A's. Um, we could throw on half a dozen teams combined, right? The Reds. Um, so from, from if you if you base your success purely on the postseason, the Royals actually do fairly well over the last 20 years or so. When they get in. 
when they did I, it right. Yeah, the the Eli, I called him the Eli Manning of baseball. <laughs> Eli Manning never won a playoff game except the two years that he won a Super Bowl, right? Like he wasn't there much. His, his record's like 500 itch. But if he got in there, he was cashing. And that and that's what this franchise did. It's right. like, fair enough, people remember the rings. And we gave them a pass. I mean, I gave them a pass. I thought maybe the Royals really did figure something out after 2015 um, because they did it once and then they did it again. Right. Um, and I thought, you know, there was talk that have the Royals really kind of figured out baseball. And they, the, the 2015, the 2014, 2015 Royals didn't just win. They did it their way. They did it in such a unique way. Low power, extremely high contact. The 2015 team relative to the rest of the league might have been the greatest contact hitting team in major league history. Their strikeout rate was so low. Unbelievable outfield defense, unbelievable bullpen. Like they had unique characteristics that made up for the fact that they didn't hit home runs. They didn't have a great starting rotation, et cetera. And we thought, geez, maybe this is, I mean, other teams thought the Royals had hit on something and they that they were sort of a thought leader in the next era of baseball. Um, and it turns out they weren't. And we, so now it's, so the, the longer we go from 2015 to today without them actually being a contender, the, the more you have to wonder, was it just one gigantic fluke? And I, I don't know. And the only way I'll know for sure that it wasn't a fluke is if they do it again. And I hopeful they will. And I think they're making some, um, they, they have made the, they have acknowledged that they had, they were doing some things wrong because they have overhauled the way that they do teach hitting in the organization, emphasizing patience, emphasizing swing playing. Um, and they've turned around some careers that we thought were hopeless in the minor leagues. Um, but until we see results at the major league level, I, I you know, the jury is still out. Yeah, and and let let's start right there. Let's get to this weekend's uh, series, at least the first part of the series so far as we've seen three games. Royals are two and one. That's a good thing. Run differential tends to be a greater indicator of what will come in the future, as opposed to uh, wins and losses. Now, three games in is a small sample size for wins and losses. It's a small sample size for run differential as well. And obviously, today's game got out of hand right away. Wind blowing out, although it wasn't like it was a home run fest. I think they were only two home runs hit, I think, uh, in the game. So it wasn't like it was just like, oh, this was a windy day that got to him. But to me, where I'm at on this ball club is, first of all, when when I had to go back to the point about the record, the record always matters. It's professional sports, all right? So it matters. I am tolerant, and to your point about the money, I am tolerant to understand that while John Sherman has a lot of money and so do all the guys that are involved in his group, spending a billion dollars uh, is spending a billion dollars. And you want to get a little bit of that money back and when the, your first two years as the owner uh, is a pandemic where revenues are cut drastically, uh, I'm open to the idea that the Royals may have to uh, keep a lower profile payroll wise than they will in the future. So let me just say that a little. I'll preface everything else I'm going to say uh, with that. But um, like the, the the goal for this year has to be at least 500. They may not get there, but within this organization, the losing has to come to an end because I think one of the things that people are forgetting about is. And, and I will defend them that the window of of contention was 13 to 17. A lot of people like to say it was just 14 and 15. It wasn't. They were a winning team in 13. Had the, the wild cards played a little different, they might have been good enough to get in there. Uh, 16 and 17. They, they were a 500 and then an 80 and 82 team. And they were leading in the wild card race both yes. years into August. Yes. So they were very much contending in those years, mm -hmm. right? So I, I will always – give them a five-year window of contention. And I think they were a team, to your point about how they were built, did they discover something? I think they were always built to play very good postseason baseball, at least the way postseason baseball worked then. High frequency of contact hitters. You're not seeing the, the riffraff fours and fives and, and long relievers that give up a lot of the home runs that the take and rake teams beat up on during the course of the regular here's, season. Here's one point I want to make, which the Royals got lucky, or, or you can say other teams have gotten unlucky since then, if the Royals, the 2014-2015 Royals make the make the playoffs even three or four years later, even two years later, I'm not sure they 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 succeed. And the reason is the baseball changed. Yeah, right. Yeah. The baseball itself, we actually started to see it. If you if you track these, you know, some of my colleagues in, in sports media have done an incredible job of breaking down the buoyancy of the baseball and the fact that it's you know the the, the, the composition of the ball itself changed. The seams seemed to be a little bit lower. The, the ball itself was a little bit more bouncy. Started in mid 2015, and but from 2016 until really 2020, I mean we saw what we we saw the end result. Home runs were dramatically up throughout, throughout baseball. I don't think a team could have won in the postseason 
with the style of play that the Royals had. Um, and frankly, I think that's that's bad for baseball. I like, and even people who are not Royals fans liked the success of the 2014, 2015 Royals because that's fun baseball. Like that's the kind of baseball that the, the commissioner's office is trying to tweak the game to get back to high contact, doubles and triples, the importance of defense, um, and this all strikeout or, or home run game is is boring, frankly, right. and it's not as exciting. Um, but that's where the game has gone, and the Royals managed to to have the, find their competitive window just before that happened. And I think we're very fortunate for that. Yeah, I, I agree, and I, I think any time, not maybe not any time, but a lot of the times when you look back and a small market team had success, there, there's going to be a little bit of a um, you know a, a perfect storm that was created, right? Like you know. College football, when K-State wins the Big 12, probably OU, at least OU or Texas was down, if not both of them, right? Same thing when Iowa gets the Big 10, Michigan or Ohio State is is going through a, a down period, right? There's a little bit of that, and I, and I think all that came together. They were very good, and I, and I want to take nothing away from them, and they were a contender for those five years. But reality is that it's now will have been 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, and if this year happens, seven years without a winning record. And I will give Dayton Moore a timeline to get it done, but we're getting to the end of that timeline. He said to me in the at the 2020 spring training before things got called off, he said, look, I, we want to build this back, but we want it to be for the long haul this time. I don't want it to be just a window and collapse. So I'm open to the idea of what he was doing with keeping Whit Merrifield and keeping Salvador Perez is, you know, because he's trying to build what is a cyclical team that you have old players, you have prime players, you have players – on the rise, right? And it's always a combination of these guys. I get it. But they have to win, and and they have to pitch better. To your point about what they're doing hitting-wise, listen, I mean, I, honestly, I sat there. I actually rolled my eyes. I was, I was with some friends watching the Masters, and I, and I, I watched the game till it was 10 nothing, and I had it on and the Masters over on a side TV, and then I'm like, okay, this gets to what my buddy Danny Klingscale would call, and so on and so on and so on, right? When we used to score the games to do post-game, there was a point in the game where it just became a turd and we're like, and, and he would write and so on and so on and so on. Like, we're not going to be breaking down. Well, then in the eighth, when, you know, he dropped that ball, like, no, the game's out of hand. It became an and so on game at that point. And I'm like, okay, fine. Chris Bubich had a rough start. But when you add in that Bubich, Coar, and Singer, <laughs> all go out there. And in the same game, on the day we're going to debut this podcast, I'm like, what is happening here? Collectively, pitching a, a total of seven innings, giving up 20 hits, giving up, what, 16 runs, walking four, and striking out seven? Like, that is the scary part because they did manage to win without really developing any pitching, but the only star or starting pitching, the only starting pitching they did develop, Jordano Ventura and Danny Duffy were on those teams, mm -hmm. right? And you can't make a living – that way, not when every team seemingly has a 200-plus strikeout guy now. Everybody has mastered the art of, of getting the swing and miss. The Royals still don't really understand the value of the swing and miss from the mound, or they can't create it. I mean, that's the terrifying part to me as I look at where this team is go going right now. Yeah, I, I think, I mean, you, you today was a, a very uh, sort of poetic reminder of what the Royals still need to do because those three guys you mentioned, you know, Bubich, Singer, and Coar, all products of that 2018 draft, which from the standpoint of getting guys to the major leagues is, is a historically successful draft because the first four guys they took, those those three guys in Daniel Lynch, all made it to the majors, all started in the major leagues last year, whereas the first team in major league history with their first four draft picks started for the team in the same season. But you know what? If you get a guy to the major leagues and he's not successful, is it really a successful draft pick? And, you know, the point of getting those four guys, and they got John Heasley. He was actually the, the, the fifth guy from that draft. Um, Jonathan Bolin, who is their fifth pick in the draft, actually has been showing was showing some of the best stuff of any of those guys in the minor leagues before he blew out his elbow. He's, he's uh, recovering from Tommy John surgery, but I'm very excited to see him back late this year. Like, there is a, there was a ton. There are other guys in that draft uh, the Royals took who are still prospects in the minor leagues. That's that's great, but the point of getting drafting five, six, seven guys in, in one draft, getting th that many guys to the major leagues, is that one or two of them will turn into above-average starters, and a couple of other other ones might be turned into useful bullpen arms, swingmen, whatever. And to this point, I mean, Brady Singer was the class of that draft class. 
he couldn't make the Royals rotation this year, right? He's in the bullpen. Um, it did not pitch, you know, when Bubich, it was, it was easy, I think, for the Royals. You can almost give them a pass on, on Bubich because they pulled him in the first inning. He wasn't throwing strikes. But, you know, it's the first series of the year. They have both Kowar and uh, Seager in the bullpen, and they're probably thinking, you know what, this is an excellent time. Pull them now. An excellent chance to get those guys a couple of long innings and and sort of get them, get them some experience, but also give them an opportunity to win their job back. I mean, the one thing I will give the Royals credit is they do have a lot of guys – they have a lot of depth right now in the major league. They have a lot of guys who deserve the opportunity to pitch in the major leagues. But what we're not seeing is any of those guys really succeed. Mubich was not bad last year. Singer was not bad last year. Um, Daniel Lynch was very disappointing, although he made some strides. He made some adjustments. He had to go back down to the minor leagues. This is a common theme with the Royals. They get to the majors. They don't pitch well. We'll get to possible reason why there. Um, went back down to the minors and made an adjustment. Came back, was better. Jackson Kowar... Jackson Kowar was kind of a disaster last year and then went out today and gave up seven runs uh, in three and a third innings. Uh, let, I know let, you've got something about yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's, let, let's talk about the disaster because Curtis, uh, our, our friend Curtis Siebold, who works with me on the radio show, um, tweeted this out. The last nine Royals pitchers to allow at least five runs in an appearance, either as a starter or reliever, including today. Going back, Jackson Kowar, Chris Bubich, Jackson Kowar, Jackson Kowar, Jackson Kowar, Carlos Hernandez, Jackson Coar, Brady Singer, Jackson Coar. Now, Bubich and Singer and Hernandez are in there that are part of this new wave, but at least they're in there once. There are nine appearances, and Jackson Coar has six of them. Curtis uh, pointed out the fact that uh, he said uh, one of them is that, you know, being on that list when you've only had, what, what he said, six of those? He's only had nine appearances in his career, and six times. He's been absolutely destroyed. I mean, that is, you know, look, Eno Saris was on with us, and I don't know if you saw his fantasy baseball uh, column that he wrote about a month or so ago, and he said that he can pretty much, you know, feels co uh, confident that in a pitcher's first four or 500 pitches, he knows what he's going to be, right? Like, he he can use the modern analytics, the spin rate, the, all the cameras, the Rapsido and, and all the different things there, and he feels pretty comfortable. We're getting there with Coar, and, and the returns, it means not good is, is what it is. If he knows right. Now, I, I, again, I want to see more of his data and, and see him come through it, but he was very down on all the Royal starters, right? Like Mike, Mike Miner, this is before Mike Miner had been dealt. Mike Miner was tops. Danny Duffy was right in there. Of course, Duffy, had, I don't think he had signed with the Dodgers yet. Um, and I know he was with the Dodgers last year, but just I was looking through guys that had come through in the Dayton Moore or been a part recently of, of the Dayton Moore regime. And and he, he had down at like the 190s for, I think, no, 160 something, I think, for Hernandez. Right. But all that draft class from 18, I mean, didn't even mention Bubich and had Coar and Singer down in the, in the 190s. I mean, that's terrifying if Eno is right about that. Speaking of speaking of of Coar, let me let me uh, see you and, and, and raise your uh, you raise your stat, Curtis. Um, you know, you you make the point that oh, you know, he he seems to give up five runs in an appearance like almost every time out. Right. Well, if you do the math, I mean, he had an eleven twenty seven ERA last season, right? And after today, it was that good for our new for people who maybe haven't heard our conversations before, Randy. Can you tell them, is that a good ERA to have as a pitcher? It is, it is not. I, I can speak with the experience of 25 years as a, uh, you know, cutting edge baseball analyst at 1127 ERA, not good. Um, but it is no longer 1127. It is now, his career ERA is now 12.15 after he gave up seven runs today. In major league history, among pitchers, he has, I think he's thrown 33 major league innings. Okay, not a lot of innings. But if we look at every single pitcher in the history of baseball who's thrown at least 30 innings, how many do you think have had a higher ERA oh, God. in their career than Jackson Coar at 12-15? I, I am assuming the answer has got to be close to none or you wouldn't be bringing it up. Um, <laughs> it is as close to zero as it can be without actually being zero. It's it one. one. <laughs> it a, a pitcher by the name uh, of Stu Fleith. F-L-Y-T-H-E, uh, and for obvious reasons, I've never heard of the guy. He pitched one season with the 1936 Philadelphia Athletics, uh, and he had an ERA of 13.04, uh, 
In 39 innings, he walked 61 batters and struck out 14. Um, and uh, he, had no, he had no control, yeah. but apparently no stuff either. No, no stuff either, exactly. And this is, you know, the Philadelphia Athletics uh, in the 1930s. Uh, not a great team. They lost 100 games that year. Uh, and uh, notably, the Stu Flythe never pitched in the major leagues again, unlike Jackson Coar. Jackson Coar was on some lists a top 100 prospect a year ago, and he has a 12 15 year old. Brady Singer, I think, made a few lists. Daniel Lynch was a top 50 prospect on several lists last year. I don't think Bubich ever made a top 100, but he was uh, certainly a top 200 guy. So the point you're making is that these are guys in the minor leagues pitched very well, were well thought of by scouts. I mean, these top 100 lists are, you know, not purely performance based. This this is a, you know, modern prospect analysis is a very sophisticated, I think, amalgam of performance as well as scouting. These are guys who looked good in the minor leagues. And like you said, Ines Harris is looking at their data in the major leagues. It's not good. And so what is, what is the thing that happens when these guys get to the major leagues? And, this is why, if, if you've seen me, I, I haven't written much about the Royals in the last year or two, but I do tweet a lot about them. And um, I, I've tried to hold my tongue. I, I don't, I'm, I'm trying to, you know, be a, a little more uh, relaxed in, in my, in my dotage here. I'm, you know, I'm not, a, I'm not a young man anymore. not a firebrand trying to be a little more polite. Um, so I try not to say mean things. Um, but at some point we have to ask ourselves, what is Cal Eldred doing for this team? <laughs> because I, I just, I, I'm not, I'm not saying, Oh, you know, I'm not calling for him to be fired. I'm calling right. for us to ask the, sincerely, what, what does he do for this organization? Who, who is it that he has helped to develop? And I'll start you. I'll give a great. You want Brad Keller. He turned Brad Keller. I, I don't, he turned Brad Keller was a rule five pick. Who had maybe the greatest season by a rule five, a rookie or greatest rookie season by a rule five pick ever. And, uh, was was you know continued to pitch well for two more seasons last year he was quietly kind of terrible um, and I would say actually the, the single most positive development of the opening series was the way Brad Keller pitched uh, on uh, on Saturday um, was you know that was vintage Brad Brad Keller so I will grant you that Brad Keller was a rookie in 2018 since then I cannot name a single young starting pitcher who has come not just exceeded expectations but come close to matching expectations. Um, you know, the Royals have done some decent work in the bullpen and they've developed, you know, Scott Barlow and, and Josh Stomont has, you know, has been, has been very good, but even the guys who are good walk a lot of batters. The Royals, the one thing you talk about strikeouts to me, the bigger issue is walks. No one on this team is throwing strikes. Chris Bubich is like a, a, a lefty with not great stuff, but it has multiple pitches and can be deceptive Stanford guy. He's the kind of guy who's supposed to survive despite like not overwhelming stuff because of command and control. And he threw 14 strikes out of 29 pitches today and he pulled. That is where I expect the pitching coach to be able to, to see results is guys throwing strikes and the Royals pitchers are not doing that. And young well, pitchers are getting destroyed. And, and to go back to your co-R uh, point, it, it, first, first year, 18 in Lexington, 26 innings. Uh, he strikes out 22 walks, 12. Uh, not not real impressive, right? That you're kind of like, eh. Yeah, ERA, it's a small sample size. Yeah, small sample size. 3.42 ERA, WHIP 118. So he's not getting knocked around with a bunch of hits. Only 19 hits, and so you're like, okay, 1.2 batters per per inning. That's on base. That that's not bad. 2019 puts two season uh, puts two stops together uh, in Wilmington and in uh, Northwest Arkansas, and he collectively has 148 innings, 141 hits. Uh, walks 43, strikes out 144. He's almost up to a batter per inning, right, in, in his strikeout, so almost a 9Ks per 9. Uh, walks 43 and 148. Uh, that's acceptable, right? Um, you know, you're, we're, we're going somewhere. 21 in the minor leagues, 81 innings, 66 hits, 34 walks. The walks are now becoming too high uh, at that point. But 115 strikeouts, and you say to yourself, okay, 115Ks in 80-plus, He's reaching back. He's finding his power stuff. It's making the control a little bit erratic, but I, I'm okay with the walks going up because look at the strikeouts are going up too. So he's effectively wild some, you know, that, that's what's going on here. All things that can be refined, but we see a lot to work with. And then he gets to the big leagues and literally, I don't know if you remember the game where he was 
I think it was against the A's where they it's like they knew what was going on. They had a they had a camera shot where they kept getting Coar and the dugout in the same shot. And it was it was uh manager, pitching coach, and I think even bench coach, all the three of them standing there looking like and Coar looked like he was looking over, going, Are you coming? Like with every pitch, are you coming to get me? Are you coming to get me? I mean, honestly, it was it was it was sad to watch. I mean, and I was like, good lord, what's going on? So to your point, the whole point there is he w- he was trending in the right direction. Like it looked like it was time to bring him up. But there are guys, and I'll give David Lesky some love, uh, who is inside the Crown Blogs, a great blog, and he comes on my radio show. He said going into last year, you know, we were talking about we thought last year would be the year you got to make a trade that hurts. He said, well, I don't know if that's true, but I think it's time to identify the guy you don't think is going to be the one, and you need to spin him. And that's the thing is, like, they don't ever seem to know who the guy is. They didn't going to be there because, like, Josh Stamont would have been worth more to this club had they spun him when he was a, a starting pitcher of prospect, right? They could have gotten more back for him than getting a guy who's a power reliever because do you know how many guys, anyone who plays fantasy baseball can tell you there are, like, 100 guys that are 13 Ks per nine out of the bullpen now. Everybody has somebody who comes in and will blow guys away. Everybody has multiple guys in their pen that does that. I mean, I, I, you sit there and prep for a baseball league, and you're like, good Lord, look at this guy. Look at this guy. Look at this guy. Look at this. There are guys that don't go drafted that are 12 and a half Ks per nine out of the bullpen. So being like, well, they did get Stamont. No, Stamont is failure. Like, you, you have to identify the guy, not failure. Stamont is not enough of a return to say, like, we know what we're doing. You have to identify the guys who are going to go Jackson Coar, and, and there's still time for him to turn it around. But if he doesn't, you've got to identify him and spin him and flip him. And they seem to be just hoping upon hope that one of these guys is going to hit. And they're not going to get rid of any of them because they're terrified they'll get rid of the wrong one. To, to defend the world a little bit, the Royals have actually done a decent job of identifying the guys who aren't going to turn turn it into the, the player that that prospect mavens think they will. Because when you think about, you know, in 15 years as Dayton Moore as general manager, can you name the prospect that got away that turned out to be better, you know, that went on to have the career that we that, that they were expected to have or even better? I mean, obviously, the sort of the – the classic example of this is is Will Myers. Right. When they did make the trade that hurt, Will Myers has turned into a perfectly average major league player, which was you know if I which if I had known that ten years ago when he was traded, I wouldn't have embarrassed myself by calling that trade the one of the worst trades the Royals had ever made instead of one of the best. Um, I, I, I get your point, but they've only made like four trades. They, this this is this is a good point. Dayton Moore is not he he. There, there is the danger of falling in love with your own players. And I think the organization, to their credit, they're a very loyal to their players. It is, it's very interesting. Dayton Moore's reputation in the game, I feel like has been somewhat rehabilitated over the last two or three years, not because of the Royals' performance on the field, not because people are like, oh, he's a, actually a brilliant general manager, but more because we have seen sort of the dark side uh, of, of of sports and the way that certain organizations treat their players so shabbily, minor league players particularly. Um, and Dayton Moore has sort of become this, almost like the voice for the benevolent, uh, the benevolent front office, the benevolent ownership group that actually treats its people, its, its, its employees like people. And um, people throughout the game who are no, no affiliation with the Royals have... I, I think have their, their respect for the organization as a place to work, as a place. If you had an opportunity to work for an organization, people yes. want to work there. They they, they paid that paid some dividends in 2020 during the pandemic when there were all, the draft went five rounds and the Royals just cleaned up on college juniors and seniors who weren't drafted and had the choice to play for any team and the, the amount they could sign for was limited. And they signed a ton of really interesting guys who could sign anywhere, but they're like the Royals treat people right. They paid their employees. They paid their minor leaguers during the pandemic. So people respect Dayton more. Um, and and, I, and I'm, it, it, on some level, it makes me proud to be a Royals fan above and above and beyond their performance on the field. Just the fact that it's, it's, you know, there's, I couldn't imagine being a fan of, I don't know, the Washington football team right now or something like right. that. Just leaves a bad taste in your mouth. But the problem, the downside of that is 
like you said, they fall in love with their players too much. He doesn't sometimes make moves, even even when it makes tons of sense. I still think trading with Merrifield two or three years ago from a pure inventory perspective, from a pure asset management perspective, would have made total amount of sense for everybody, for the Royals to get players, for the team that got him to get a major league ready-to-win-now guy for, for a contender, and for maybe for what Merrifield himself – to go and play for a team that has a chance to make the playoffs during the prime of his career. Now that the Royals are moving into that stage where they hope to, he's, what, 32 years old now. Last year was a, a bit of a dip for him, and, you know, the concern is he's not the player he used to be. So they do make decisions sometimes that are great from a people perspective, but not necessarily great from a baseball perspective. Well, and that's great. Then everybody in baseball, when they get fired for another team, will will line up to come get a job here in Kansas City. But I think to your point – and, and and I and listen, I'm not I am rooting for Dayton Moore. I love the guy. He is great. Every time I see Dayton Moore, he asks me about my daughters. He remembers I have daughters. I mean, he is a genuinely good human being, and I, I am rooting my ass off for him. And it's hard to have to sit and question things. And I haven't, you know, I've I've given him a leash, I think, of five years, right? But now it it I'm you know, and I had somebody say you know, somebody put up here like uh, another roses and sunshine like no it won't but somebody's got to you know ask the questions that need to be asked right and i know both you and i are not afraid to do that he's a he is a great human being and i do believe he creates a culture that benefits a baseball team but to quote him when i asked him i said hey you know if it came down to player a or player b and one seemed like the better guy or like i said which guy are you going to take in a draft he said talent always reigns supreme it's always first and foremost about talent now that with a of course with a caveat of like if we think the guy's going to self-destruct we're not going to take him right because his talent's not going to get on the field but so i i i do think there's something there to what he does and i think creating that culture and that environment helped that team win i also think the fans of kansas city finally being fed up and in 2014 demanding the firing of dayton moore and ned yost and and being pissed i'm, I'm going to tell you the players there was no love affair between the players and the fans of Kansas City. I was in that clubhouse, and I've I've got still on tape one guy MF and the fans up and down, and I t I told the the Royals front office I said okay here it is, I said now everybody has a bad day, so I'm gonna let it go, right? But I got it, and if I hear it again, then they're both gonna be played, right? And so I think they they were feeling the pressure, and they didn't burst. The, you know, it wasn't the love that got him over the hump. I being in that clubhouse in 14, I feel like what did it was the fans that had it. And they got the kick in the ass from the fans that I think sometimes an organization needs to give you. And I don't know that they can do that. I, I do think it's a great place to work because it's like you're never getting fired. No matter how bad you are at your job, you're not getting fired. That, that's a great place to work, but I don't know that it makes for a great place to win. I, I, I would like to say that's a harsh statement, but then I look at the fact that Cal Eldred is still the pitching coach of the Kansas City Royals. And, I mean, at the end of last season, I mean, there wasn't even a hint that, that they that his job might be uh, you know, on the line, that they were disappointed with his performance. It was just, you know, it was, it was uh, to me, kind of a tone-deaf move that they didn't understand – Maybe my, my little corner of the Twitter world is not a, a representative sample of Royals fans. That's probably true. But I can tell you, our little corner of the world, patience with Cal Eldred has, has worn out because, you know, the Royals have been spending so much draft capital on pitching, 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 pitching. They took all those pitchers in 2018. Bobby went, by the way, we are almost 40 minutes into our first podcast, and I believe we just named Bobby Wick Jr. for the first time. We are doing a terrible job I know. of seeing this podcast to I Royals know. fans. I'm well, just going to stop. I have to say his name a couple times to cleanse the yeah. mind here. Bobby was, Witt Jr. We'll get to him, guys. We'll get yes. to him. Yeah. But, yeah. Um, you know, but in 2020, they took Asa Lacey. There were some, some other really talented hitters on the board. They took Asa Lacey. Asa Lacey, everybody agrees. The guy's got incredible stuff. Throws 99 four pitches. Can't throw strikes yet. This could become a problem. Last year, they shocked the world. They had the seventh pick in the draft. They were two really good high school hitters that I really liked that they could have taken, Brady House and Khalil Watson. They went completely off the board, tried to save some money, took a high school pitcher, Frank Mazzucato. Might be great. They, they, with the money they saved, they, they took another really high bonus guy in the second round, local kid, Ben Caderna, right? They took another pitcher later on, Shane Panzini, another high school guy, pitching, pitching, pitching. Well, if you're, you know, and I know Dayton Moore loves to say pitching is the currency of baseball. And and my response to that is, I'm sorry, Dayton, 
I disagree with you because I'm an arrogant SOB. And, you know, even though I've never worked in the game, I have my own opinions. No, talent is the currency of baseball. Yeah. And if you don't, you know what? And if pitching is the currency, you know what you can do with currency? You can sell it. You can also buy it. Yeah. So if you have talent, trade, if you develop the hitters, trade for the pitchers if, if you can't develop pitching. And the Royals, we're seeing it on the field right now. It's still very much in flux. Today was a really seminal day, I think, when you had three guys went out there. All three of them gave up more runs than, than innings pitched. You know, if you can't develop pitching, then why is this guy still being employed? Yeah. Uh, let's do turn the corner. Let's talk about the hitting. Let's talk about Bobby Wood Jr. MJ Melendez and Nick Prado look like they're on the way. I know we're going to get to our minor league minute coming up here uh, a little bit later on. Something we want to feature each time we do our, our podcast. But Bobby Wood Jr., I, I just threw down what I think his career is going to be. 275, 350, 500. So an 850 OPS guy. 400 career homers. 1,250 RBIs. 1,400 runs. 250 stolen bases. Right. I, I, I'm now. What am I going on? Everybody else's people I respect. Keith Law, you know Jeff Passan's work. Uh, you know the the the, the fine works of, of baseball prospectus and fan graphs and and different things like that. I, I, I'm no scout. I can see how fast he can run. I can see the way he can get low, like the body, the nimbleness of his body to be able to dig. You know to be able to get, make that stop, reach out, get it, come up firing. You can see that this is an elite level athlete. It's an elite level athlete who has consistently put the bat on the ball. The strikeout rate's a little high, but I think that's that comes with a lot of power, so it's acceptable. And it comes with a pretty good eye as well because he, he takes his walks. Um, I don't I don't know that he's going to be a hundred and thirty walk guy or anything like that, but you know he, he's going to add to what his value is. That's what I think he's going to be, and I think it's the, they he he almost has to be that. Because of all the guys they brought up, right, and all the guys they drafted, who has really lived up to their draft slot? Has Eric Hosmer at two lived up to it? Has Mike Moustakis, uh, or Hosmer at three, has Moustakis at two? We know Bubba Starling, you know, flamed out. They, they, nothing but love for the KC kid, but it, it didn't work. Um, you know, like, time and time, like Christian Cologne at four, like, they are so long overdue for a guy to hit and be a star. I know it's not easy to find a star. I know it's not easy to hit in baseball, but it's not as hard as this organization has made it look. This guy, though, looks like the real deal. Do you agree? I do with the, the only caveat is what you just said, is the Royals' history with this. And it, it's, you know, you talk about the frustration the fans had back in 2014. I think part of that, um, I, you know, at the time was the frustration that, the Royals kept making excuses for people like Hosmer and Moustakis, and even to some degree, Alex Gordon, you know, you kept hearing, oh, it takes 1,500 at-bats to really evaluate a player. And it's like, wouldn't it be nice if just once it didn't take a, you know, top Weird. five draft pick, top five prospect in all of baseball, 1,500 at-bats in the major leagues before he actually was a good player? Um, and, I mean – you know, I don't, I don't remember Juan Soto taking 1,500 at-bats to figure out how to play in the major leagues. You know, Carlos Correa didn't. You know, Wander Franco didn't. There's, there's I, I disagree. In fact, if anything, players get to the major leagues now more prepared, I think, than they have ever been. Because they are, you know, if you're, if you're a, a talented high school player, you're not just facing the high school kids in your district who are throwing 85 miles an hour. You're going to like the area code games. You're playing maybe for Team USA. You are seeing the best competition of your in your age range in the country. And guys are getting in, in ready for the major leagues. And actually, from an analytical perspective, it has been very difficult because the last 10, 15 years, the, the, the way we describe it is the age curve has been broken. You know, it used to be you get if you got to the major leagues at 21, you didn't have to be a good, good player. If you were average, that was incredibly promising because You'd get better, steadily better, steadily better until you peak reasonably around age 27, right? Maybe it's 26, maybe it's 28, 27, come back down. I mean, you think of George, just think of George Brett. George Brett got to the major leagues at like 20. At 21, he was okay. By 22, he was a really good player. And 27, he hit 390, right? And then you have your your gradual curve down. And so when someone like, when Eric Hosmer actually had a pretty good rookie season, right? At 293, they get 19 home runs, you know, came up in early May. He was 21 years old. And you're thinking to yourself, 
just this standard age curve, he's going to be great in a couple of years. He never really got much better than, than he was as a rookie. And I'm not, this is not husband. My point is that's actually very common now in major league baseball in general. I, I think roughly around the same time, um, you may remember, um, he might still be in the majors. No more Mazzara. Do you remember the name of yeah. Rangers outfielder? Came to the major leagues, was 21 years old as a rookie at 266, 324, 19. OPS not plus of 93. I don't know. I would slightly below average, but 21 years old. By the, the old way of playing baseball, 21 years old, you're okay. You're going to be a star. He's never had an OPS. I mean, he, he's, he's 27 now. He's never had an OPS plus of 100 in the major leagues. He's basically a replacement level talent. And there are so many guys like that. So there's no like there's no reason. Unfortunately, sometimes guys are as good as they're ever going to be right when they get to the major leagues. But by that token, there's no reason why Bobby Wade Jr. cannot be a star, the best player on this team this year. You got some you got some career numbers. What what you think? Very, very close to what you have. I, I you know I kind of I was saying like two seventy five with like four hundred and twenty home runs. You know, very close to what you had. Okay. Um, and I think that the key there, you know, it probably about 280 steals. Okay. Um, and the, the key thing is I just elite defense. I mean, the, the, I, I put it all together. I, I look at him. I, I'd like to think that he could have a career, especially at third base. One of the things I do like the, the, the Royals have done um, was moving Bobby Witt to third base. And I know a lot of people um, think that, you know, it's silly to move the, such an elite prospect to make way for someone like Adam who who can't stay healthy. But I, I've been, I was pushing for that from last season. And the reason is simply we, we've seen a history of good pros, good defensive shortstop prospects move to third base and be absolutely elite defenders at third. Manny Machado, to me, I, I think Manny Machado is like a really a great uh, model for the, for the Bobby Witt uh, career path. Uh, they, you know, he was absolutely a, a, a great shortstop in the minor leagues, but the, uh, the Orioles had J.J. Hardy. They decided to move him to third base. And – for the first three, four years of his career, he was like a plus 20, plus 25 defender at third base. And to me, you know, getting a 20 runs on defense alone at third base, third base to me is such an underrated defensive position. He's going to hit wherever he plays. He's going to be an elite hitter for what at third base or at shortstop. But if you give me an above average hitter, who's also a plus 20 defender. That's a five or six win player. And I think he could be like, he could have like a Scott Rowland type career path, maybe. Uh, maybe a, a little fewer walks, but a lot more speed. Um, and Scott Rowland is, you know, from an analytical perspective, is a Hall of Famer. He's not in the Hall of Fame yet, but I think he will be here in the next couple of years. I think he ended up being like 70 wins above replacement for his career. That's an optimistic pro pro uh, projection for sure. Um, you know, you think about the, the best Royal, uh, you know, the, the best comp in, in the Royals organization to Bobby Wood would be Alex Gordon, who was a number two pick, and ended up, I think, his career at 34, 35 more. Uh, by baseball reference, which makes him, you know, a top 10 Royal all time. I don't, I would not call Alex Gordon dis, uh, a disappointment. He had an unusual career path, but I think from beginning to end, he had a, 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 an excellent career. I think Bobby Witt can be better. He's younger than Gordon was as a rookie. Um, I think he's going to have more defensive value on the infield. And I think the fact that he has the speed that he has uh, uh, adds another element that even if he's not hitting a, at an elite pace, he's going to provide value in so many other ways. I've been wanting to have been, been thinking about this, and I and I wanted to ask you: Are you okay with the fact that they have like I, I know they're all good problems to have, but generally teams then take those good problems, which are really called depth, and they spin them to fill what that what are called needs. Okay, they have two elite power hitting catchers. One that's a proven commodity. One that's the best power hitting catching prospect in baseball. They have. Three guys that can play shortstop, presumably, at a gold glove level. At least the Royals will tell you, Mondesi's at a gold glove, gold glove level. You like Bobby Witt in that category as well. And Nicky Lopez, uh, Jeff Passon said, should have won it. Forget about being nominated. Should have won it uh, last year. I know the Royals thought he was robbed by not at least getting a nomination there. They have three of those guys, right? Throw in Whit Merrifield, they have four premium middle infield guys. Um, yet they can't develop outfielders. They uh, are struggling to find starting pitching. Like, are you okay with this? And if they're going to make a switch, why haven't they figured out the switch of where MJ Melendez is going to play and gotten him there and said, this is where you are. Why didn't they look at it and go, okay. Like to me, the fact that he hasn't been playing left field or third base or first base or some, you know, whatever it is again, comes back to the, well, we're not really sure we're hoping 
you know, but we don't want to move anyone until we see what happens, right? Like the depth is great, but at some point you need to be good at all the spots. Like Michael A. Taylor in center field and, and, and Ben Attendi is almost, um, you know, he's almost a, a winner's curse, right? Like if he doesn't play well, you don't want him. You let him walk, right? If he does play well, he's too expensive. He walks because somebody else is going to pay him more. Right. And so like the, the whole outfield is a mystery after this year. Right. Uh, so why not be spinning some of these guys to fill outfield spots? Why not some of them on the seat of the outfield? Why not some of these moves? No, I, absolutely. And, and you make a, um, a, a very a salient point. I will say with MJ Melinda specifically, the Royals are it's in a very unusual position to have two elite catchers. I'm an elite starting catcher and then an elite starting catching prospect. And it's a really tricky problem because if you have a, if you have two elite defensive shortstops, you can move one of them to third base, as we just saw, and you can get value and almost as much value because, yeah, you're losing a little bit of positional value, but you're getting so much defense. You have two elite center fielders, move one to left field or to right field, and you've got a great, you know, there's no downside there. You've got two elite first basemen, but what a DH. You know, I mean, the Royals, they're not, I wouldn't say elite, but, you know, if Nick Prado and Vinny Pasquantino both pan out, okay, Vinny Pasquantino is your, your starting DH. Catcher is the one position on the field where if you move that guy off the position, the, the, the positional value you lose is immense. And the skill set of a catcher just doesn't translate very well anywhere else. It doesn't translate up the middle at all. I mean, we've seen one catcher, right. you know, Craig Biggio in my lifetime, who basically moved to an up the middle position and it worked. Right. And he was an, a very unusually athletic catcher. I mean, he was as a catcher, he was like stealing tons of bases, setting all sorts of like speed records for catchers. You know, maybe maybe a Jason Kendall, young Jason Kendall could have moved. I mean, Jason Kendall could steal a ton of bases. Um, I don't think MJ Melendez is that guy. That's not his skill set. Um, you, if you move him to first base, the, you, there isn't a bigger positional difference in terms of the, the offense that you expect from two positions than catcher in first base. A catcher who hits 270 with 15 home runs, that's, that's a top five catcher in the league. Uh, first baseman who hits 270 with 15 home runs is, you know, in danger of losing his job. Yeah. The only position that really makes any sense to move to is third base. And that is, it's, even that is very rare. I've seen basically two guys, two catchers who moved to third base, uh, two, two top catching type prospects moved to third base and ended up having long careers. One of them was Todd Zeal, you may recall, yep. who had a very long career at third base. He had some of the worst defensive numbers. And mind you, in the 1990s, we didn't have these numbers. And this is all in retrospect. Um, but he didn't have a great defensive reputation at third base. And uh, his numbers suggest it really cost a lot of value. He was not a good defender. The other one was Brandon Each with the Tigers. And he was – he actually, that career sa- – the, the career move saved his career. He was actually an elite defensive third baseman. Um, but uh, – and, and ended up hitting well enough to keep his job there. But that's like two guys I can think of in about 30 years. So – when you have an MJ Melendez, to me, and this is uh, it was uh, one of my hot takes I threw out on Twitter last year and, and almost got me ratioed, I said, do you trade this guy? Because the only way you're going to get value for him is keeping him a catcher. Trade him for an elite center field prospect, an elite outfield prospect. Um, because otherwise, you know, people are like, oh, you move Salvi to DH. Okay, fine, you move Salvi to DH. You're losing the defensive value, the positional value of Salvador Perez. Maybe what you do... I mean, the, 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 the although, to, although I, I will say if Salvi's going to hit 48 home runs, right? If he's going to be a 40 home run hitter, that, that bat does play a DH. It I mean, plays it's there, but it's still, you lose the value. He plays because he's so good, but like a catcher, it's elite. And you yeah. go from an elite def- the catcher, hitting catcher to a good hitting DH. I'm just saying, you're well, going to maximize you know, the if, value by moving him for another player. Uh, agreed. And, and, and I'm on 100% on the same page with you, but when who was the last DH that hit 40 home runs for the Royals? Jorge Soler, was he a DH? I guess he was more of a kind player. of. I mean, yeah, okay, before him, <laughs> it never happened, right? Yeah, I mean, I mean the- usually they're DH. I mean, if they had a DH that could hit, that would actually be something for the Royals because usually it's, it's, uh, you know, Mark Quinn or, you know, the toad of the month. That now, it, when they won the World Series, um, they did have uh, a good DH, they went out and got him, right? They signed him. Um, now coming off one of the weirdest seasons where he held out. It, one coming off a freak ankle injury, then holding out into, uh, you know, and, and, and signing late. His numbers were a wreck because he, he didn't sign. and yeah, No, to- it, it worked out very well. I mean, obviously, they had Billy Butler the year before, and Billy Butler was, you know, that was that was the position he was born for, and, and that's fine. 
you, you know, you can't just assume you're going to get production from DH. The, the, the way to thread the needle here, which people, I've heard people say, is you basically you keep both of them and then you, you know, you start Salvi 90 or 100 times behind the plate. And you start Melendez 60 or 70 times. And then the, the other days they DH. So you basically always have them both in the lineup, one at catcher, one at DH. You basically don't need a third catcher. They, you know, they're, they're the two catchers you go with. I guess that can work. I've just, I don't think I've ever seen that happen where a team has two elite catchers that they just kind of share the job like that. And I just, again, I'm not saying they have to trade them, but the fact that the Royals don't even seem to consider that an option. Right. Sometimes the Royals, Dave Moore said this himself a couple of years ago. He's like, you know, I need to be more transactional. I think that was the term he used. He said that and he's not being more transactional. And I'm not saying make, make trade, don't turn it into uh, to Jerry DePoto and, you know, don't make trades just for the sake of making trades. But there are times where, like you said, you look at, you, you look at the, the talent distribution on your roster. And it's like, okay, we've got all these infielders. We've got first baseman catcher. We don't have any outfielders. What do we do? There's a, there, there are rules that allow you to turn excess at one position into, you know, and, and fill a hole somewhere else. So um, that is something I would like them to do. And, and, and Jim Bowden, I remember talking to him in 2012, I think it was, he said, listen, the Royals are getting to the point where they have to make the trade that hurts. That's the way he described it. And we, we latched onto that at that time and like, okay. And of course that off season, they made a trade that hurt. They moved Will Myers uh, along with others, Jake go to Rizzi uh, in that deal as well to go get James Shields and Wade Davis, right? Like two guys that ended up being absolute pillars, one for the turnaround and one all the way to the finish with, with Wade Davis and Wade even then was spun as we know for Jorge Soler. Like, the problem is after the fact, you start hearing these stories. And everybody's talking about how, well, Will Myers was kind of a pain in the ass. And you're like, well, did you make it? I don't know that you even made a trade that hurt there, right? Like, I don't know that you – I don't think you believed in Jake Odorizzi because his numbers weren't eye-popping. And even Jake Odorizzi will tell you his career, whatever it's been, which at times has been very good, he gives all the credit to the Rays teaching him the changeup, right? Like, that that was it. Like, that's where he says – his success came from. It wasn't in Milwaukee. It wasn't in Kansas city. It's from once he got to Tampa, that's where he had success. So, I mean, I don't know that the Royals really even thought Oda Rizzi was that great. I, I, mean, I, I, fair, I don't, but at the same time, at the time they made the trade, I mean, it hurt just from the standpoint of everybody was yelling and screaming yeah. at them. No, I mean, it, they, it, they traded high. They sold high. They did, they did. But my point is this, that like, even if you want to say, okay, Hey, they nailed that trade. Right. And it's and Dayton Moore is always talking about, we want to make a trade that's good for both teams. I, I'd like you to host somebody sometime. It is okay to just get the absolute best of somebody else in a deal. Your job is to make the Royals better, not make your club and the other club better. And so it's just hard when I keep hearing like, like people fall over themselves to talk about how Will Myers was kind of a pain in the ass now. And I'm like, well, damn, it is like how many people in the Royals organization are putting this information out there? Because if that was the case, then they were just offloading a malcontent. Right, it kind of happened to fit. I don't want to take anything away from it. It was a successful trade. I defended the trade then. I'll defend it now, as you and I went round and round about it uh, back in those days. But I mean, I, 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 it, I bring it up now because I, like, can they actually do that? He said he wanted to be more transactional. He has not been more transactional. They need to make a trade for, of depth for need. Why should we believe it's going to happen unless MJ Melendez turns into a raging pain in the ass? Then perhaps he would be dealt. Well, I think what what is, what's interesting to me is I thought that's kind of where we were headed with all the rumors in spring training about the Royals trading for Frankie Montas. With I, I did too. I thought that was the trade that's going to hurt. Um, and you know, I, I was a little bit concerned just because it's like, okay, you make that trade, you only get him for two years. Maybe you're doing it a year early. That's kind of where I felt a little bit with the the the, um, the way Davis James Shields trade was. We're doing this a year too early. And maybe, you know, it, it, but it worked out because the second year was, well, you know, James Shields took them to the, to the wild card game. Um, but I was looking forward to that. And, you know, you maybe the A's wanted too much, but you you look at what the A's did and they traded Sean Mania to, to the Padres for two decent prospects. But, like, I would have given up that much talent for – even for one year, it was only – Sean Mania is only under contract for this season. But – I mean, especially, you know, okay, this is recency bias with what happened today, but man, if you could trade one of those 2018, you know, draft draft guys, if you could throw in Kowar or, or, you know, even, you know, Lubitsch or Singer into a trade for Montes, that's the trade that hurts. But it's like you've got to evaluate your own guys like they did with Will Myers and say, okay, this guy, the, the, the per perception of this guy in the industry is higher than what we actually know this guy to be. 
this is the time to move him. I don't think they feel that way about a Melendez. They actually genuinely like those guys. Then you move Sal Perez. Well, I that and then that's the trade that you that you absolutely make. But my God, if they wouldn't trade Whit Merrifield, I know they are not trading the icon of the franchise, the guy whose number is going to be retired one day, Salvador Perez. Just, I, and, and so, and so, and I agree. I, I don't think it's going to happen. You agree with me? Just just kind of just a little bit on this because we got a couple other things we want to hit before we get out of here. Um, do you agree with me that? By keeping Whit Merrifield and keeping Salvador Perez, Bobby Wood Jr. needs to be a success and has to be a success right away. Like, that's what those guys were kept for, right? In my opinion, that was the reason you kept them, was to have guys that were proven products in the lineup so that Bobby Wood Jr. didn't have to step in and be the guy. But shockingly, in one offseason, he went from being not good enough to be on the team to batting in the most premium position in the batting order, batting second which is something that has always chapped my ass about the Royals. Bring a guy up and throw him right in at one, two, or three, right? Like, he's not good enough to be on your roster. Now he's the most important. I don't, I don't mind that with Bobby Witt. For one thing, Bobby right. Witt is a elite guy, and the reason they didn't bring him up last year was, for, I mean, if they'd been in contention, he absolutely would have been in there. The, the, you know, the, the, the Royals, to their credit, nobody expected them to play service time games with him, even before – the, the new CBA right. gave teams some some incentive to bring guys up on opening day. Everybody assumed he was going to be there, okay. but was, they literally didn't have a 40 man. They just didn't want to give up a 40 man roster spot. But, the, but I agree. No, I agree in the sense that they have had times where the guy comes up and he's expected to immediately right. be the, the fulcrum of the lineup or whatever. But, but this time now, the reason you kept Sal Perez and you got Whit Merrifield and presumably you got Andrew Benatendi where you only have team control for a couple of years and not the years that you figure to be a contender is to make it easier for young guys to come up and have success. I mean, if, if that, that, if they, they're, if they're not doing that, then yeah, why are they here? It's the same. It's not the reason you signed Zach Greinke, but certainly to me, one of the reasons I was so excited to bring back Zach Greinke, aside from just the, the thrill of having him come back after all these years, um, you know, the, the, the little boy in me, I feel like I was still a little boy the last time he pitched for the Royals. Um, you know, very excited about that, but, it's, it's exactly if, if Cal Eldred can't be the pitching, you know, can't be a good pitching coach. Maybe Zach Greinke can be the guy who teaches Singer and Bubich and Coar and Lynch, you know, how to pitch. It's like watch this guy who can't, who barely touches ninety anymore, get major league hitters out with command, with fearlessness, change speeds, athletic, you know, the, the playing good defense, all of that stuff. Hopefully, they will learn from him. Early returns today, not great, but it's it's a long season. Um, so yes, if if those guys aren't developing. If, the, if Bobby Witt has a Alex Gordon-like rookie season, it's going to be a disappointment, not just because we expect better from him, but because they in, you know, threw away an opportunity to restock this, the system with talent in order to create an infrastructure that would allow the young talent they do have to come up and play better from day one. And if that doesn't happen, then you have to ask what they're doing. Uh, by the way, uh, if you're uh, watching us right now via the uh, YouTube or the Twitch or the uh, Facebook, go ahead and hit that like, uh, hit the love button, uh, make sure you retweet it, get the word out there about the uh, Kaufman Corner podcast that Randy and I are going to be doing. Uh, it would help us out a lot. It don't cost you nothing, uh, but it would be a big help for us. So we encourage you to do that. I know we've had already a number of people that have done it, and we appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you very much, and, and, and uh, look forward to doing a lot more podcasts and hopefully getting a lot more likes along the way. Uh, so I would appreciate it. Subscribe if you would, please, as well. That'll help us out. And that way, you know, every time we uh, we do a broadcast, you'll get it in your uh, notifications there that we're going to be having one. Um, any other likes, dislikes, any other takeaways from this opening series that you think uh, deserves mentioning right now? I, mean, I, mean, I will say, look, the bullpen, the, the Royals do actually a fairly good job of developing bull, bullpen guys. And, I mean, those first two wins, they do that with a lot of, uh, you know, guys coming out of the bullpen and, and pitching well. You know, Barlow was a huge find. I love Stomont. Um, but even the guys like, you know, Colin Snyder, who I was a real surprise being added to the 40-man roster, his numbers in the minor leagues weren't great. And it's one of those things where I, I feel like the Royals have made a, a, have turned the corner a little bit in that three, four years ago, they put a guy like that on the roster. And it's like, and my perception is, oh, they don't know what they're doing. And now my perception is they may know something that's not showing up in the numbers. He went out, he, he pitched well in his major league debut. It's very early. Um, but like Jake Brett's, who was a you know a minor league free agent signing a year ago, um, and was had a very very nice rookie season and you know throws ninety nine from the left side, walks too many guys like 
like everyone else on the team, but has the stuff to do that. The Royals have done a good job of finding guys, um, you know, in the minor leagues who are not necessarily heralded um, and getting the most out of them in one of these stints. So that part, uh, that part of it, I, I do feel like the Royals, without spending a ton of money on their bullpen, um, have, have gotten have gotten good results. And you know, last year they brought back Wade Davis and Greg Holland for sort of a retirement tour. It was nice. They didn't hurt. We weren't going to win anyway. But ultimately, I mean, you look at the bullpen results and they were dragged down by those two guys. This year, you pretty much everybody in that bullpen. I mean, I really love the Amir Garrett, uh, the trade of Mike Miner to get Amir Garrett. Yeah, you know, the guy's got a lot of attitude. He's feisty. Um, you know, if there's if there's ever a uh, an all out brawl with the other team, I want, I want that guy on my side. But he's also really talented. Um, and, you know, and I, I just love the bullpen. On this. And playing the role, playing the role of Calvin Pickering in the bench clearing brawl will be. Amir Garrett. Maybe not quite as big, but he he, he plays big in the fight. Yes, yes. So yes. One, before we finish up, there is one other piece. I feel like people have stuck with us this long. There's a little, um, I don't want to say good news, but very interesting um, news item that I feel has completely gone under the radar Okay. that I want to bring up regarding Bobby Wood Jr. We'll call it our minor league minute, will we not? We could we could call it that. We could yeah, we could do that. Our our now major league, but was minor league until a minute ago. Minute. Yeah. Um, so Bobby Wood Jr. Um, the, the the one thing that really caught my eye, Jeff Paxson, who you know is ESPN's uh, uh, you know national writer, right. kid, but a Kansas City local lives locally, has his ear on the ground with the Royals. I would say more than most teams, although he's extremely well connected with all teams. He, uh, in his, uh, like, I three- plug for my radio show. He's our major league baseball insider. He moonlights on ESPN uh, uh, right, uh, as their uh, senior baseball insider there. But <laughs> main focus is the, is the segment he does each week of the program on sports radio, 810 WHB. Yeah, just, a, just a, a good friend of ours. And, uh, yeah, so I, I, I feel like we can, I, I trust when he says something about the end, you know, what's going on in the game. I listen, he's as well connected as just about anybody in the sport. Right. So in his 2022 MLB season preview, he's got a lot of things in here. Um, I'm going through his column. Yeah, it's a good one, by the way. Yeah, and you get to the baseball insider hat. Here are 10 names that could pop up on the transaction line. And like the first one, Aaron Judge, who we know came very, you know, there was at least negotiations up until opening day about a a contract. Number two, Jose Ramirez. Jose Ramirez just signed a five-year contract extension. Number three was Frankie Montes and Sean Manier of Oakland. One of those guys has been traded. Number four is Bobby Wood Jr. What's Bobby Wood Jr. doing on a transaction wire? Well, let me read this to you. San Diego signed Fernando Tatis Jr. to a $340 million deal after 143 games. Tampa Bay guaranteed $185 million to Wander Franco following a 70-game rookie season. Witt, 21, is that caliber of player. Whether he stays at third base as, he's expect, as, as, as he is expected to on opening day this season or moves to his natural position at shortstop doesn't really matter. He's the future of this franchise, and teams in smaller markets must be hyper-aggressive in locking up superstars early. Now, is he saying, oh, I suggest the Royals should? I mean, if that's what he's doing, well, no duh. Or is he saying, I know something? Well, and, and, and I actually had that conversation the day that that column or the day after that column came out with Jeff on the show. And I said exactly the same thing. I said, we don't, we don't just report on the sports. We also report on the people who report on the sports and Jeff Passon doesn't throw darts. And I said, so I'm going to put you on the spot right here. Are you telling me that you think a deal is done? And he said, no, I think both sides have discussed it. He said, I think they backed off and said, we want Bobby to focus on baseball and not have to be thinking about a contract. So I don't think it'll happen this year the way he detailed it a little bit more on the radio show and people can go back. That would be two Thursdays ago. If you want to hit my uh, podcast on my radio show at 810 WHP.com and listen to that conversation and judge for yourself what Jeff said, but he, he made it sound like, you know, it, at least not early, let him get off and rolling and playing good ball. But like, you know, right now he's got two hits in, in three games. I understand. So I think they want to let him get started, but I do think you're right. They want to get this done sooner rather than later. See, and, but the more important thing is if Bobby Witt Jr. is willing to consider something like that sooner rather than later, to me, that would be the most 
you know, important development of the entire season. If you get him signed, you know, and we just talked to you, you just mentioned how the Royals, you know, it's like, oh, they always want to make trades to help both teams. Why not make a trade that just helps you? Like, it's great the Royals want him to get his feet wet. But you know what? Do what's best for the Kansas City Royals, too. And that might not mean waiting until he has a, he has a rookie of the year season, you know, and the price, you know, and then and then suddenly you're like, uh, do we really want to commit right. 250 million or whatever it is? Get this guy signed. If you can, I mean, what the, the Wander Franco deal is is a great template for that. Maybe, maybe there are a little bit more. I don't know, but like, if you could put him in a Royals uniform for twelve years, if you yes. if that contract ends in a year that ends in two zero three, then suddenly, the Kansas City has the greatest player in football signed into the twenty thirties and the number one prospect in baseball, at least by some rankings, signed in twenty thirty. That is a situation literally no other franchise base of any, you know, any city uh, in, in America would have. That, to me, would be an extremely positive development. Uh, I, I'll go you a step further. I don't even think it's like if you could, they have to. There is no discussion about it. Because one, he's got to be as good as you're talking about because it's been too many times that guys haven't been. And two, they have to keep him. I think you're right. By the way, to answer Matt's question, uh, every Sunday – uh, at uh, 10 o'clock Central Time, uh, Randy and I are, is our plan. We'll have life things that happen, I'm sure, along the way that we'll have to maneuver around, be it to a Monday or a Saturday or what have you. And it will be up. It takes a little time to get Apple to populate things, uh, but it will be up as a podcast. So if you ever miss it, but you can also subscribe to the YouTube channel, Twitch channel. You'll be able to get these things uh, there as well. So Sundays uh, at 10 Central for those that joined in late. That's when Randy and I will be doing this. I jumped the gun because that wasn't your minor league minute. You did have a minor league note you wanted to point out that you thought was big for our minor league minute. And it is well, so position change. It is. We can, we can discuss that briefly because it's too early in the season to really talk about like results. I mean, Nick Prado's yeah. hit three home runs. That's, oh, that's awesome. But two or three games, I figured let's not focus on results. I just wanted to focus on um, what, what we're seeing on the box score um, in terms of position. And that is because we, we had just been talking about how the world's uh, distributing their talent around the field and they've got all these infielders and catchers and first basemen, but they don't really have any outfielders. Um, so I just thought it was very interesting. Nick Lofton, who was the Royals second first round pick, a supplemental okay. first round pick um, out of 20, I guess, 2019, uh, 20, yeah, I think 20, 2019 or 20, I can't keep it. He's behind Bobby Witt, right? No, it was 2020. It was the pandemic year. Okay. Um, Cause Ace Lacey was their the number, their number one pick. Nick Lofton was the next pick and coming out of the draft, he was like, he was supposed to be a college, a college hitter who, with no no one uh, elite skill, but kind of did everything well. And the more you read about him, we're like, is this guy just supposed to be like a Whit Merrifield? And to the world's credit, that's really what he kind of projects as now. He's like, he 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 didn't hit thirty home runs last year, but like um, he hit close to three hundred, low strikeout rate in, in A ball, about fifteen home runs, played all over the infield, second base, shortstop, third. Um, a really interesting uh, prospect. And I just wanted to bring up the fact that. Uh, so far this season, he is playing exclusively in center field. And I think that is the world's acknowledging that we've got to figure out a way to to take the talent that we have, because we have one of the five or ten best farm systems in baseball by most measures, um, and start constructing a roster that actually can take a major league you know, field and win. Um, and uh, so I'm, I'm excited to see what Nick Lofton can do in center field. He doesn't have mirror field speed necessarily, but he does have the defensive instincts, the arm, um, and he's in double A now and, you know, you know, they've got Michael Taylor under contract for two years, but I, I see Michael Taylor really as a, as a great fourth outfield type, ideally would not be starting every day. So there's a chance we might see Nick Lofton by the end of the season, certainly by next year could be starting in the Royals, uh, uh outfield. And there's a place for him now, whereas we're at shortstop second base, there's really just no position for him. Yeah. And the Royals have liked him. And so that means that they do see a future with them on the big league club. Uh, let's leave with this. What's your, what was your pick for the Royals record uh, going into this? So I'm going with, I'm, I'm, I'm chickening out a little bit. I'm going with 82 and 80. So are I'm, you really? Yeah. So I'm going to say that they're, I mean, look, th I'm terrible at predicting the Royals records. I, I just, it is the single worst thing I do as an analyst, because there's just no way for me to sell, uh, to separate my heart from my brain. But I just, I, I, I want to believe that this team can be over 500. But at the same time, I'm skeptical that they can actually make the playoffs. So I feel like 82 and 80 is that sweet spot. Even with the 12-team postseason, you're probably not going to make the playoffs with that record. But you are going to be competitive uh, and interesting all season long. Uh, I have them at 74 wins. And I was like, God, I'm an idiot when they jumped out 2-0 and 
And then today I'm like, no. Yeah, yeah, no. yeah, yeah. They're two and one, but they're they've been outscored eighteen to six. So. Yeah, yeah. The, uh, the, the run differential says that there are some tough day, uh, tough days coming ahead. But well, if uh, you if you take my average prediction over the last fifteen years, you could probably take about seven or eight wins out of it uh, as, as as ballast. So that would put us back down around seventy four. Which Nanny, the eternal optimist. I'm yeah. I still am. They haven't beaten it out of me yet. <laughs> Randy, I'll tell you what, love it. I uh, love talking Royals baseball with you. Glad we're going to do it every Sunday at 10 o'clock. I'll reiterate to people, you'll be able to get it a lot of different ways. We're going to stream it live 10 p.m. Central. If you are catching this on the podcast or you're catching us later on, two, three weeks down the road, and you're hearing episode one of the Coffin Corner podcast, we do ask you if you would uh, retweet our tweets uh, when we put them out there about the show. We'd love for everybody who's a Royals fan to get a chance to uh, be a part of the conversation if you're catching us via Twitter or on the podcast later on. Uh, you can be a part of the conversation in the chat room if you're on Twitch, if you're on Facebook, if you're on YouTube, and if you would subscribe and like at all those venues, we would appreciate it. Randy, great stuff as always, buddy. Appreciate it. We'll talk again next Sunday. This was fun, man. Looking forward to next week. Absolutely. Randy Gisarelli, Seren Petro, saying thanks for joining us here on the Kaufman Corner.